I'm Laura Jenkinson Brown, aka Greek Myth Comics, and I've been a teacher of classical civilization, ancient history, and Latin for the best part of the last 15 years. I'm very pleased to be presenting to you on making things easier for neurodiverse pupils in the classics classroom. Overview and experience, the context in which I am writing this. While I'm not an expert in teaching neurodiverse pupils, I do have teaching experience during which time I have met and taught a great deal of differently abled pupils, neurodiverse pupils and pupils with additional medical needs. I teach Latin, classical civilization and ancient history, although I've also been an English teacher and examiner and run drama and tabletop roleplay gaming clubs. I'm focusing on these experiences. I'm not trying to give a be all and end all presentation on how to teach neurodiverse pupils, but instead going by my own experience as a teacher and someone with a neurodiversity, which is dyscalculia. I'm aiming to give some practical suggestions that everyone can use. The key points overall, however, to remember are every teacher is a teacher of someone with neurodiversity. It's not a case of one size fits all when it comes to needs, but there are things that you can do to make it easier and more accessible for everyone. And the best thing you can be is aware and flexible. I'm lucky to work at a school in which working with a pupil's individual needs is seen as the norm and we have a dedicated curriculum support department that can advise us on how best to make lessons more accessible. Many of the following suggestions I have learned from this department, while the rest of it has been accident or trial and error. And while I do try to do all of these things with my classes, I definitely don't manage all of the time. Whatever you can do helps. I've organised the suggestions into the four following areas. Lesson materials, pacing and structure, assessment and deadlines, and managing expectations. As with the videos I make for my students, where I promise I don't speak quite as fast, I've made this video with full information so that at the end of each slide you can pause it to read through the rest of the information yourself. Lesson materials. For a start, if you're using sheets that go to be stuck in books, have them pre-cut to fit the page, rather than having students cut them out themselves. Printed text materials on a pale colour that isn't white is also very, very useful. This works particularly well with sources on ancient history or classics. So, for example, with my GCSE Classical Civilization course, I have Athens or Greece on green and Rome or blue. Putting the title right in the middle and or at the top right of sheets makes it much easier to be seen when you flick through a book or page, which is really helpful for people with dyspraxia. Longer texts need to be chunked. They need to have well-spaced lines and extra space between the paragraphs. And if you can include a wide margin on the outer side, even better, or a summative phrase on the inside for them to annotate next to. Folders and workbooks or packs definitely are better than exercise books. This way work can go straight in the folder and anyone missing a lesson can see what gap they need to fill and these are much easier to revise from as well. If you then have uh, subheadings already included the pupils can make notes next to them and then they can see at a glance when they're flicking through their notes what they have written about. And if you're using an interactive whiteboard and you use a PowerPoint or other display, have it go alongside. This just aids students making notes confidently without having to constantly question you, as some will. If you have text on a background on a PowerPoint, try not to make it black on white. This can pop out and be really uncomfortable to look at. I myself find this really difficult to see. If a pupil uses a coloured gel overlay to help them focus on a text, that can work for them. Some even may have tented glasses to be able to look at the board. Using a mini whiteboard in discussions or translations allows less verbal pupils to still participate and it allows their ideas to be thought through before neat work is completed, relieving anxiety. If you have any information, accompany it with something visual. Anything you can do to make information more concrete and accessible is good and will promote understanding on a deeper level. With pacing and structure, if possible, have a set structure for your lessons and give clear instructions repeated at least twice at the start of the task. If possible, also have these on the board. If possible, also have these on the board and use a continuous system so people can recognise them in advance. Also, try and have a set of terms and phrases that you use with continuity from lesson to lesson to describe different tasks and this way pupils know what the expectations are for these tasks after practice. Do give step-by-step -step instructions. Never assume that pupils know what you want them to do. Even when it's on the board they will sometimes get it wrong or be frustrated if they think they're going to get it wrong beforehand. Many pupils will not need such detailed instructions but leaving the instructions up ensures all are supported. Don't rush through work. 
unlike the way I'm rushing through this PowerPoint. Make sure you build in time to cover material and write about it or complete exercises. If you need to manage different abilities in the class, include a thinking question at the end of a longer slide for those who have finished faster. And don't expect everyone to finish in the time you have allotted as being enough. Don't penalise or highlight those that have not finished as fast as the others. Read along with text yourself. Invite people to read loud, but do not force them to. And do give praise if they do. Try to avoid correcting pronunciation until afterwards and explain why when you're doing it to avoid embarrassment by interrupting and correcting it at the time. When asking pupils to make bullet points from longer chunks of text, teach them how. Do not penalise them for copying it out directly, but model the best bullet points. Use bold typography within longer chunks to subtly model the points to bullet, and don't expect pupils to be able to do this without modelling and practice. If you make the resource available elsewhere after the lesson, this also reduces the need for pupils to feel anxious about making enough notes at the time. Be aware of the need for fidget busters, medical devices and pupils leaving the room. Some pupils find using an item or side task to occupy their distracted brain can help with focus, but it can be distracting for the teacher. So you do need to discuss these privately before class where possible to avoid surprises or confusion. And boundaries about usage are fine. They are there to aid and not distract. And if they're not practical and cause a distraction to the whole class, then an alternative may need to be discussed. Some pupils do have a medical advice that it is imperative they use. And amazingly, yes, some people do seem to think that they can police these. And some people may need to leave a class, often with some urgency, if they have a medical or mental need that becomes apparent. Ideally, know about these beforehand if you can, but be aware that people may ask and do not have a policy of just denying the need. Build in a buffer lesson to the middle or end of your scheme of work to allow for topics to take longer or need to be recovered. It can be reclaimed later. With assessment, some pupils will require additional time. Find this out in advance if possible and make sure you give it. Include allowances on any time frame written on the board as standard and schools will often provide a card for pupils to subtly place on their desks to remind teachers of their extra time allowance. It is important. Some pupils will require the use of word processing to complete assessments. Hopefully you will again know this in advance and aid them to use this. When you're setting deadlines, set a fair deadline. For example, a week for longer words such as essays or practice questions, as long as it's not where time taken is also being assessed. Be prepared to be flexible. If you can, create a semi-task where it is planned first. Getting pupils to plan is so very important. And be flexible, but not lackadaisical. Having clear deadlines is still important, but the deadline is not the end of the world. If you can highlight the reason for the deadline, that can often help. For example, showing how external work fits into classwork and needs to be done beforehand or even showing your marking schedule that can help fix the importance of the deadline for pupils so that they have a reason for completing it to that time that they can understand. Don't give a test without making it clear in advance that a test will occur. For example in a homework set out that the work is going to be used for a test. Help students be organised by being consistent yourself. Set homework or deadlines consistently or on the same day each week, for example, and remind pupils to pack the bags the night before. You might not think it's your job, but any help is good help, even when it comes to perhaps giving people copies of their timetable, including when homework is set and due, if no one has done so for them yet. When it comes to managing expectations, some pupils may ask very direct and unusual questions or ask without putting up their hand, thereby interrupting the teacher. Answer them as simply and directly as possible without being phased or appearing cross if you have been interrupted. Do remind them about the policy of raising a hand if you have that in your class. Some of these questions may arise to do with implicit meaning or suggestion which has not been understood. And sometimes role playing a situation either in class or externally can help a pupil understand the implicit meaning. However, if you keep terms concrete and use visual aids if you need to go abstract, that can help in advance. Some pupils may not know when to speak or to stop speaking and may continue speaking off topic. If you gently remind them of the topic or gently remind them that they need to put up their hand or that it's someone else's turn to speak, that is better than cutting them off full stop. It may be necessary to establish a rule with them to prevent off topic talk, such as a finishing signal or a list of danger topics that are too diverting to bring up. And setting boundaries can be extremely helpful, especially once you've discussed it with the pupil beforehand.
Feedback clearly, depending on what works best. Highlighting sections clearly with an annotation works very well indeed, or giving a short list of targets, positives and negatives at the end to give a focal point for improvement. Handing back essays with a plan highlighted show what was achieved or is missing is also very direct, and cover sheets or performers for feedback that include these direct references to assessment objectives are really good. Providing exemplar work for phrasing, using quotations, and writing in the correct tone is extremely helpful because some people simply don't know how to do this beforehand. Never write off a pupil simply because they seem unfocused, uninterested or miss deadlines. Writing off a neurodiverse pupil as unteachable can be as harmful as ignoring their needs entirely and maintaining your requirements whilst also being flexible is the key to them achieving in your class. Keeping in touch about their progress with their tutor or head of house or pastoral head or curriculum support or their parents, not necessarily all of them because it's likely there will be someone else to be the first contact point for a pupil with needs, and keeping records of their work to be able to send to these individuals is also really, really helpful and will definitely help you as well monitor their progress. In addition, considering remote learning, which a lot of people have had to do lately. Most of these ideas that I've just run through were very much challenged during the early days of the pandemic as lockdown teaching made everyone suddenly have to be an expert in other things online and these techniques and approaches simply don't apply in a lot of those cases. This new necessity of teaching from home was for some a welcome change and for others a new challenge when it came to teaching or learning. So I've added my personal observations here, the positives of online learning for neurodiverse pupils and the negatives. When you compare these to perhaps what the positives of online learning for teachers and the negatives of online learning for teachers as well, you find that there tend to be more negatives overall. And while some schools, for example, mine gave policy changes to try and make things easier for pupils, and I had a particular approach that helped with pupils not necessarily needing to be online all the time, this method of teaching certainly made things very different for a lot of pupils, and it was difficult for them to do. And the reason why I want to bring this up is what neurotypical people found to be the positives and negatives is often how neurodiverse people feel all the time. And what I've listed as helping neurodiverse pupils is now what I find necessary for nearly all my classes in general post online lockdown teaching. So to go back to my original point, awareness and flexibility are key to making all lessons easier for both neurodiverse and neurotypical pupils. Thank you so much for listening.